I'm Rani Murthy, I'm artistic director of Russ uh, Theatre and uh, I'm just, um, this is my ninth production, I'm going to my ninth production and uh, we've been around, I think we're celebrating our tenth anniversary this year. Wonderful, what's the name of your ninth production? My next production is called If Only Sharuk Khan <laughs> and it's about a Sharuk Khan fan club, three middle-aged women who actually are Asian but come from Kenya and um, we're lulled into this false sense of security that you know they are a fan club, got, the audience is going to participate in the weekly meetings. These women lead very separate lives so only when they go back into their own rooms do we get the sense of their inner lives. I, it, the, the, the trajectory of this, of this play is very interesting because I, I, when I was in about five years ago, I, was, I, was, I made a pitch for the Manchester International Festival because they were, they were asking for some Manchester-based artists to, 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 to you know, send in proposals. And I had, this is known as the ITG project, because I wanted to do it in a suburban Manchester home where these immigrant women live and the audience goes into each room and, you know. Wow. And it was shortlisted but didn't get, get, didn't get commissioned. So I kept that idea and it kind of transmogrified into this whole notion of how people reinvent themselves and immigrants tend to reinvent their, their iconography, their mythologies. So, you know, if you grew up with a religion that when you could go, you know, leave your homeland, you tend to, you tend to find new, uh, a, a way of replacing or reinventing that narrative. And um, for me, Shalok Khan is an incredibly transitional figure. You know, it's not quite the, for me, it's more Dharmendra and, and Rajesh Khan. Okay. If I, if I want to really be honest about my Bollywood connection. But um, uh, I think Shalok Khan, because he's so media savvy, has kind of, you know, really found a way of really entering into people's consciousness and not just South Asians or people from the subcontinent, you know, you go mm. anywhere in the world and he is that. So I think for these three women he's become that that figure of escape, of fantasy, of of recalling their life that they left behind. And being an immigrant myself, I understand that completely. And I wanted to look at an older generation because I think a lot of um, British Asian writing focuses on the young and mm -hmm. the new generation and all their angst yeah. and often the older generation are left out because it's too uncomfortable, mm -hmm. too ugly to talk about, too, um, uh, too disconcerting to try and look at our parents in a way that, that they can be funny, that they had an inner life, that they had a sexuality, that they had a life that they left behind because it's so much consumed by the idea that, oh well, they are just you know, ciphers, two-dimensional, and they just don't, don't speak English well enough, or they, they, they're invisible, they're visible in, in, in the media. And so a lot of my work really explores uh, the people who are left behind slightly, you know, by the whole migrant experience. So the three women have their inner lives and their inner secrets, and don't share it with each other until a black Kenyan man knocks at the door and looks for his biological mother, and then wow. it kind of totally discombobulates the whole household yeah. and we get into that whole uh, relationship of racism that happened in, in uh, Africa mm. with the indentured Indians who probably went there or Asians who went there. And it really stems from, from me taking my work out to South Africa and to Mauritius and places like that, Zimbabwe, um, where I, I realized that there were generations of Asians who were there who then, you know, it just makes that whole diasporic migrant experience much richer for me. And then when you come back here and you think that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, discourse is all about what's in your back door, what's happening down your street, rather than this whole global epic journeys that people have made. And you realize that actually, this is why I think Rasa, you know, we started out, when I first came here, I, I started out thinking about how do I fit in to the model of what I'm supposed to be? If you're a brown person making theatre, then how do you fit in there? And I was desperately looking for stories that were still integral to who I am, but at the same time, kind of was able, it, you know, was, was accessible to an audience that mm -hmm. I didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. But in a way, that was really good because what happened was I decided that I would just try to try and. It, no matter which story I chose to tell, it always came from a, a line, a image, a metaphor that it, it is strongly from my background, 
Now I have to go into my background in order to, you know, so I'm a little history and geography lesson now because otherwise it, you, you really do not place Ranjana, daughter of Ganesha Murthy, son of Ilya Dambi, in the way that that I have reinvented myself here as Rani Murthy, the, the artist. I am Silanese in the days when Sri Lanka hadn't even been formed yet. So we were known as Jaffna Tamils or Silanese in Kuala Lumpur where we were, I was born in the 60s when it was post-colonial and had just attained independence. Very exciting time when it was a multiracial Malaysia. So it was all about uh, if you're a Malaysian, you, you know, there's no, let's forget about the homeland. You are all Malaysians, we just have been, you know, released from the hold of the colonial masters, and it was all about that. And I remember as a child eating Chinese noodles, uh, play, just having played a, 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 a game that was very Malay, and my grandmother talking to me in Tamil, and then walking down the street, and this Chinese opera is playing, and he's eating noodles, and then watching Chinese opera getting a bit bored, coming back, we knew the stories. So it was, it was totally about being immersed in many, many cultures and being able to see them as not uh, something alien, but totally like, like it, it would be just one blended into the other. And then even, even in what we call Singapore English or Manglish, our languages blended in one into another. So in fact, the English that I'm using now isn't even the English I'm most comfortable with because I would begin the sentence in Malay, use a Chinese word, swear word usually, and then end up with a, with a Malay, you know, saying. So it's a kind of, um, uh, uh, yeah, schizophrenic almost experience in a good way, you know, because I think when you grow up like that, I think you, you, you it stays with you. It's of course. Absolutely. And, and then, you, then you don't see difference. You see what we do share. And, and, and of course, in, 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 in that part of Southeast Asia, the, the, the ultimate shared experience is food and storytelling. And I have stayed true to that. In fact, almost everything I've done is all about that idea that you can um, really, once you tell something from the heart, it sort of seems to be about a shared experience. So it didn't quite translate to theatre yet, but I understand storytelling. And my, I come from a family of great storytellers, and um, the stories they told, you know, when B.S. Nightfall talks about growing up in Trinidad and India being this very foreign country, the land of his imagination, for us, um, growing up, um, Jaffna, and that part of Ceylon as it was then, in 1973, changed to Sri Lanka, politically a different country, a politically a different name, but the same country, the same culture, the same land of my imagination, the land of my stories. The, the, the narr narrative they fed us, and of course, you know, when you, when you sit around a dinner table and your grandmother is telling you these stories in a language that you have a small grasp of, not really quite. And, and it, it, it evokes all sorts of, of very immediate feelings, which are coming back to me now in waves of loss and pain because, you know, in 2009, that part, that region, uh, was completely annihilated and devastated. And uh, the whole idea of being a Tamil from that particular region is, is completely gone except in our imaginations. So, so going back one full circle, one at that time as a child did not understand how you are in going to become a custodian of your of your ancestors' stories because um, that's your responsibility now. You cannot avoid being uh, completely charged by that very early childhood stories. It didn't didn't occur to me then. It was irrelevant. I was I was uh, going to be a doctor. That was what it, what it was going to be. I didn't even think I was going to be a writer and be, have this weight of responsibility on my shoulders. Um, but what we took for granted ended in 1969 when there were race riots in Malaysia. When I talk about race riots here in Britain, people are, are just completely confounded by how, how why, what? 
you know, it's a, it's, isn't that a wonderful harmonious, you know, you think of Malaysia, you think of beaches and harmonious. That's, but the thing is that when the ground shifts from under your feet at a very early age, you, it, it stays with you. How old were you? Changed. I was 69, I was 6, and the sky just changed colour to red because the neighbouring uh, kampongs, which is the, you know, the word used for villages around suburbia, there were lots of little satellite villages. Um, they were just up in flames, and one day you would, you would hear rumours that the Indians were killing the the Malays, the Malays were killing the Chinese, Chinese were killing, and for about half a year we were in literally curfew, which is almost twenty-four hour curfew. I didn't go to school, um, and 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 when we when we emerge from all of that, you realise that your neighbours could turn against you. That that stays with you. That tension. That idea that actually the sense of being very at peace and safe is 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 really the the, the luxury of people who have you know like like my husband who's, who's born and grown up in, in, in Lancashire in Hume and of course he's been around the world but his heart and mind and all the people and all the buildings that he knows is still there intact. I have not had that. It has never been about this sense of being a majority. I have never been a majority of anything in any of any life that I've led. Uh, I completely uh, understand how politics can change one's life. How suddenly uh, you can belong, and somebody decides actually you don't, and that is a very tenuous. Uh, existence, uh, it, it, it feeds into your soul because, and, and so that's why I align myself to anyone, the children in Syria, to Afghanistan, to to the to, the, to, to what's happening in Sri Lanka, to what's happening, what happened in Rwanda. I align myself with them because I understand on a very fundamental level, although it doesn't look like it, because I didn't go through any half of what they did. But in terms of degree. It, the only difference is the degree of how one feels when you have experienced that amount of violence and hatred from a very young age. I think it, it, it really, I mean, to hear that, some, that this uncle so-and-so was, was sawn in half by so-and-so in the, in the railway, by the railway line, and at, at, at the age of six, that stays with you because you, you know the person and the idea that he had been, his whole body, so, you know, even if I didn't witness it. So, I think that, you know, growing up with those tensions, I think is, is a very, um, well, it's significant now, I think, because you can, you can then now draw upon this whole thing of, well, there for the grace of God, because that's why I'm attracted to stories about that, that kind of space in which you're not sure who's going to turn against you. You know, when September 11th happened, I remember I was doing a workshop in um, well, Cheetham Hill, but also in Darwin, uh, in Blackburn, I should say, with a young group of young, very young men, men and women, and um, the, the young, the, the young Muslim men turned to me and said, "You know, they, they're looking at us differently." I completely understood that because I, at the age of six, I could see that that happened, and however. Um, the politicians covered it all up, and every time May 13th, 1969 comes up, um, there's a little bit free song in Malaysia, but I feel it deep inside me because I can feel it in my side, I can feel it in, uh, in Johannesburg when I was there, or, you know, it, it, there are tensions, and we are human beings, and I think we all respond in that same way when you feel that you're not quite belong, you don't quite belong there, or you go to a country like Mauritius, and then it's all about who came there first. Who was there first? So we are territorial. And the moment you any kind of oppression is lifted, then we retreat to our tribes. And I think I realized that from a very young age. So I've um, <laughs> so went we raised Ryan stickers, we wanted to go to Singapore. My father wanted us educated in English, and um, because the bard was the god in our house, so he wanted to you know, make sure that we we learned how Shakespeare so and could quote it. So he took us to Singapore. The idea was to live in Johor Bahru, which is the southernmost state in Malaysia, and move to Singapore. But we loved it at JB so much because it was a quiet little sleepy town that 
that we thought, okay, we can do this. We can take a passport every day and go to school and come back. That's what my dad's idea was. Uh, that was heaven, you know. But for us, immediately it was all about explaining myself, explaining my uniform to the immigration officer. Because in Malaysia, everybody had the same uniform. And suddenly I was in a Singapore school. So difference and that sense of not belonging, that sense of being an outsider was very strong in my, in my background. For a long time, I thought that was a, such a disadvantage, such a horrible thing to be. And I think that's why I, I became funny, because then, then you belong straight away. So you tell stories and you're funny. And that was it. And I was larger than life. I was always larger than everybody else, literally. I was the elephant in the room. So I would just, you know, laugh about it and joke about it. And everybody just sort of accepted that I was Rani. Uh, Ranjana or Ranchana because my uncle forgot to spell it properly. So Ranchana in Malay means dictation or um, what was the other word? Uh, documentary. So they would tease me. So Ranchana became my name instead of Ranjana, which is the proper Tamil pronunciation. You see, so this is all all adding up to a very strange mix of the person you see before you. So then I, I go to Singapore. I became Ran and. Um, this kind of kind of class clown uh, did a bit of theatre. Uh, never quite understood that I was a storyteller. Started to do a little bit of theatre, and of course, what happened was in the eighties when I was sort of starting to look at the world in a slightly different way. Um, we were discovering the Singapore language, and uh, which is what which is very similar to Malaysian English, Manglish, and Singlish. When we used it on stage, it was often just for, to be funny. Everybody just laughed. And the idea of exploring our true voices, it never occurred to us that, you know, like, it never occurred to us how ridiculous it was that I played Lady Bracknell or I was in Miss Julie or, you know, it, it never occurred that a Chinese man was kissing me in a play in a Tom Stoppard play. It just never occurred that this is a completely strange situation for anybody else, because for us, we were all kind of colorblind or pretending to be. And then when you start to explore your own stories, and you start to think in terms of a tribe, then you start to get into this very complicated journey, because um, even from then, I would always think the majority whoever was the major majority racially, was allowed to have the serious, complex stories. And anyone who was brown and like me was the little auntie in the background or, you know, she should just come and do a little cameo and go off. And it didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to me to question it. We did a production of Miss Julie. And the play was, this was in 1998, and it was the 100th anniversary of the original Miss Julie, uh, Strindberg's Julie, uh, Miss Julie, which was caused a big storm in, in Sweden when it was first performed. And of course that was because of sexual politics and that servant was having an affair with the mistress of the house. Now in the Singaporean Miss Ju Julie, I played Christine, the servant. Jean was played by Sassi, another dark skin. They were both dark skin, Indian. And Miss Julie was a was an almost porcelain, beautiful Chinese woman. And it was about race. It was about skin color. Did we question it? No. Audience accepted it. Nobody actually thought, this is something wrong here, that, okay, as if there are no Chinese servants, as if only the Indians could be this, this kind of thing. And I remember that. There was a big discussion. The only discussion that we had about this was because Heineken Beer was going to support, or was going to sponsor the show. And that, um, will this be offensive to the Indians because all they did are alcoholic? <laughs> we did not question it. And that's, that's, that's the key. That's what unlocked the key for me when I first came to Britain. Because um, you were starting here to, to, to unravel all of this or, or, or unpick all of these very subtle or we thought subtle differences and, and, and in, in equities uh, in, in racial and, and you know all sorts of all layers of politics gender and all that 
thrown into the mix. But we were starting to discover our own stories. And I have to tell you that I, when I started to, to really look at my background, it caused, as, as innocent looking as I am, as motherly and cozy as I am, as your favorite auntie as I am, I became controversial. And this is borne out by what Miriam McCaber, the South African activist, amazing woman said, when you speak the truth of your life, you become controversial. Because I was speaking the truth of what I was going through as a Hindu woman brought up in a highly traditional, highly uh, close-knit community where if you told the line, you were loved and given everything. But the moment you start to step out of the, the scheme of things, the moment you start to question, you have a little voice, um, that's it. You know, you kind of really are ostracized. And uh, to talk about that was really controversial and I didn't realize that. Then I came here to do a little bit of a master's degree, which I did very half-heartedly. Here being I London. In, in, in Manchester, I met Arthur by then, and I couldn't, we couldn't live openly. It's, this is all going to go. My relatives might see this anyway. That <laughs> They've ostracized me, so who cares? Um, I couldn't live with him openly, so I thought if I came here and lived with him, because if I had to fight my whole, you know, relatives and everybody, I better make sure this man doesn't do a, you know, Medea on me, suddenly leave me and go off, and you know, I'll, I'll have to be Medea and kill my children or something <laughs> to get his attention. But that's what I did. I did. I thought if the relationship doesn't work out, I've got a master's degree. That's that's great. So, but the degree was in theatre and education because. I was just obsessed with this idea of let these poor Singaporean and Malaysian kids not go through what we went through, which is to learn to question just out of default, not because just out of coincidence that we suddenly you know, learn to question, not default, but our default mode was actually just keep quiet and listen. But by chance, I learned how to ask something, and it just didn't even occur to me that that was an option. So that was your inspiration point in theatre? Yeah. Wonderful. Because, because uh, it was the best way to actually show the multiplicity of identities that one had to negotiate at, on a daily basis. Mm. I don't even think I have one identity. That's why I think that it, for me, uh, being here uh, gives me a certain amount of freedom. By that, but then the freedom is then taken away when people give you money because people give you money to put you in a box. The box is this British Asian box. Um, so you're kind of sort of in the ballpark. They could, I, I don't think people really uh, want you to stray too much. I mean, if I did a, a, a kind of all white version of the Mahabharata, that might, that might be a bit acceptable because it's the Mahabharata. But it's, it's, it's a kind of um, double-edged sword, but we'll come to that later. But, uh, I, I discovered in TIE a kind of left-wing socialist idea of education uh, which I took back to me to Singapore and uh, that didn't go down very well uh, because I think, I think you, you, you know, I think when the, when the brain is unleashed you know, and suddenly that you had it in you but it's all kind of acceptable in, a, in another country and you go back and you realize you're, you're slammed back into a world of caution, uh, that everything is a sensitive issue, anything that questions authority is a no-no. And here I was encouraging children to question the authority of a character that we are presenting on stage, which is what Kiani is about. And there was, you know, where we have, you know, I mean, Singapore is pretty much the brave new world society, you know, where the, the alpha race, the, the, the kids who go to the, the bigger, big institutions, and then there are the, the, the kids who have learning difficulties and are kept in 1950s buildings with one computer rather than each student having a computer of their own, even in the 90s in Raffles or Anglo Chinese Junior College. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, aspirational society. I can't fault it too much because it does produce results, but there is a real, that, at that time, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm placing it this very firmly in the 90s, it was a very controversial thing to introduce 
this kind of theatre to young people. And I think we've got our fingers wrapped for it. And I remember an article came out that said the university uh, in Singapore was, uh, 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 oh, what is it called? Oh, it's a lovely term. I have to remember this phrase because it was the bedrock of dissidents. You know, this <laughs> dissidents. I mean, dissidents were incredibly mild and people. I, I was the most dissident of those dissidents, but anyway, that was that was the I, the long and short of it. And I realized that there was a ceiling, there was a, a there was a ceiling for me. There was also a limit to how much I could explore my my own uh, life, because in the hierarchy of things, being a brown woman comes right down there. It's it's not you know any different anywhere else. So you really have to assert yourself. When I came here. In '96, I came to Manchester, arrived in Manchester Airport, and rang my parents. They said the, 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 the city's been bombed. It was the 15th of June, 1996. The whole, of the, oh, the IRA bomb, the IRA bomb had gone up, gone off in, uh, in the middle of Manchester City. So it was quite fortuitous because I had arrived, and the major theatres had suddenly gone dark. Royal Exchange and Contact Theatre was dark for other reasons, not because of the bomb, but it was being refurbished. And it was interesting because I, I, I thought, okay, well, maybe I, I need to go and teach at the university because of this, this uh, oh, that was why I went to academia, because to justify my theater, my nightlife, I had to have the day job. So I became an academic, and it took me a long time to weed myself out of that, because you can't do both. Uh, there are very few academics who can really be an artist because um, it, it requires two very different energies. And I, I, whenever anybody tells me um, they, they, are, they want to do you know, theatre, but you know, I want to have the day job, so I'll go and teach, and I'll do the theatre, it'll be fine. I always say, you'll just be a shadow artist, so get it out of your system very quickly, and then move on. And live, live simply, but do what you need to do, because it's not going to work out. And I realized that I took a year to just sort of try and find what it is I needed to do. And in that year, um, it, I, I remembered the stories of, of, of... I think it takes, you know, being exiled from the land of your birth to start to really think about who you really are. Because uh, when you're over there, you're, all your anxieties are there all around you, and you don't think about them. But when you're away, the, 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 the focus of your anxieties, your angst, whatever you want to call it, the, what makes you tick as a person, what's your passion, it starts to, 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 you know, you start to focus in on that. And I started to think about my childhood and upbringing, and uh, a little kernel of, of an idea started forming. Never thought I'd do a one-woman show. I thought it was the most narcissistic thing in the world for an audience to stand and watch one person, you know, delivering whatever, and it, you can be as, you know, I, I just never thought I would do it, I just found that, I never thought I would write for myself, I just found that anathema at that time, but I, nobody was queuing up to give me work, and I thought, okay, I'll just see what I can do, I'm just, and, um, and I used to joke that I was living on the Arthur Smith Arts Council Fund, which is Arts Smith Fund, because I never thought I would depend on somebody for, for, you know, uh, my, well-being, financial well-being, but for one year I did that, and I think you know this is a, a big lesson because you need to have time to reflect, you need to have time to get rid of the mess and noise in your head, to actually start to think about what makes what you what do you really want to say, and I thought what I have to say really is I'm looking at young people. I was looking very close. I used to walk down Wimstone Road and look closely at these young Asians. And they were, they were, they were a few generations apart, and yet I, I just saw in them the same kind of anxieties and confusion that I had growing up, which is that you have one culture indoors, and you have to negotiate something else outside, and never the twain shall meet. You walk inside your home, and you are swept 500 years into, in my case, Hindu mythology, where the woman has decorum, is there for 
yes, you're honoured for your strength, but don't talk too much. That sort of feeling that you get. And this, this very strange, uh, uh, almost, yeah, strange schizoid existence. I could see in these young people and thought, well, actually, maybe I have something to say here. Maybe I, maybe I, I can talk about my, maybe I can tell a growing up story that is sort of like mine, but it's a kind of confluence of all the, all the things that my Malay friends, my Chinese friends had growing up. Like, you know, we, we, we did see uh, the sari become, you know, the moment a 12 year old is draped in a sari, it becomes this, this metaphorical trap. Or when a Chinese girl is doing the tea ceremony and you're kneeling before your ancestors, you start to become a certain way, or a Malay girl puts the, what we used to call a pudo, it's in the hijab, and when you, when you start to cover your hair, how it changed you, or a young man at 12 goes through circumcision but can't talk about it and we know it's happening. And so, so it's very, these coming of age things that I was thinking about that linked all of us. And I was thinking of the kids here that, you know, that you are supposed to support in Manchester City or United at certain ages and at a certain age you learn to drive, at a certain age you have your first trip to the pub with your father, these coming of age stories that seem to be symbolic of something deeper and yet they are so banal but they have a deep meaning if you don't do it. It's only when you don't subscribe to that that it starts to become uncomfortable to the rest of the tribe. And so I started to write a piece about rituals uh, called Puja. Puja is um, a needs offering or a prayer in, in Hindu uh, culture. And, and uh, I was born at the wrong time. And I thought this is really funny. I thought I'd write a really surreal piece about being born at the wrong time because the time of birth has to be calculated according to Jaffna time. But it was calculated according to Kuala Lumpur time. It was completely wrong. So I'm on a cusp. So am I Chitre, am I Swadi, that no priest could know. All these Brahmin priests were paid lots of money by my, my relatives to find out what is a horoscope because a horoscope dictates everything that this woman's life is going to be. So my life was completely shattered right from the beginning because nobody could decide what my time of birth was. So that was the starting point of my play because it's a funny line about how I'm doomed right from the start. I had no way. My life is never going to be in my control. I was never going to be in charge of it. At every point in my life, there was some big ritual. And these rituals are really beautiful. So what I did was I got Arthur to video these you know, lovely little rituals that I did where you, you, you scooped out the lime and you put the ghee and you made little lime oil lamps to Durga or you made little dumplings for Lord Ganesha, the elephant had gold. So every ritual was, was then uh, punctuated by my real life. So going to the disco, hiding my miniskirt, you know, all that kind of thing, meeting uh, illicit young men, uh, meeting something not illicit young men, having an illicit meeting with a young man, get the words right, right? See, even that's illicit. But <laughs> serving tea to to this man who I've never met before, but I'm supposed to go out with, so that, you know, we would, uh, be, it's all, you know, the matchmaking, the, the, every point of my life that was punctuated right down to the time I was, so the age of 10 to the time I was 26 when I married a banana tree. So I actually had a banana tree in the, in the show, and everybody thought it was a hoot, that I, because then I made it into a big joke that he was the Tom Cruise of all banana trees, and he was short, and beautiful strong arms and was beautiful. But the ritual was actually a, a, a ritual because um, in my horoscope it said that it had a serious side to it, but it was all very funny and then I, the punchline was that really it was a funeral, and a, it's a wedding and a funeral at the same ceremony because you cut the banana tree, kill him, because in real life you're, you'll be widowed within a year of marriage, so that's what's predicted in your horoscope. So you do a, a ritual, Ashwari Rai has gone through this, okay. a ritual uh, which then kills your first husband, which means that then now you can marry a human husband. So this is the kind of thing, now psychologically at the age of 24, two degrees behind me, I was, I was 
this this person one day, and then the next day I'm getting up at four in the morning, dressed in a sari with with gold uh, with the glass bangles, and then go through this funeral, then change into my jeans and t-shirt, take the body of my husband, put it in a bin bag, take it to the river, and, and send him off. So that was the that was the the, the, the situation, but in, in theatre you can explore it in a way that then shifts that personal into into the realm of well, I could see that there were people affected by it. There were there was a my most and we did at the Green Room, and it was so loud because I think there's something in the ether that then that that this 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 play was going to have a life, you know. Ironically, that was the play that took me back to Sri Lanka, that took my, my family back to Sri Lanka because the British Council then discovered it and took, took me to Sri Lanka. And I was the first Tamil woman to perform in the war zone and perform this play that they had spent such a long time fighting, you know, uphold these values. And I was actually going there doing a play that actually demolished these values because what I was trying to say with Puja is don't mix up faith with dogma. And don't try and control your children because, especially in the war zone, um, everything it's like it's like Lord of the Flies, isn't it? All the, the structures in your life, all the things that all the rituals that you think make up your safe, wonderful, comfortable life get demolished within a heartbeat. And what have you left? What do you have left? What makes us human? And so I think that was a very powerful start to my theatre life here because it started me thinking that actually if you tell the truth of your own life and if you tell the truth from your point of view because after all what is art but somebody's point of view this is why I can't stand going to see anything that is this nebulous airy fairy beautifully you know beautiful sets beautiful visual but it's 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 not a bold representation of an artist's point of view because after all that's what, that's the shared experience. The shared experience is that I can turn to the next person and he's tearing because we are, we are experiencing the same, same thoughts and feelings about this. May not be exactly the same, may not be the specifics, but the actual intention of the, of the artist is very clear. I think that's a very, um, it's something I, I, I kind of learned from watching the Chinese opera, watching Bharatanatyam, watching Kathakali from a very young age, that you know exactly the intention of, of whoever is there because they've trained long enough to step on that stage and they know exactly when they move or turn around, you we know what it means. You know, it's 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 those tropes that, that I learned from a very early age and and, and I think it, it comes back. That's why I think education of, of young people is so important because I think that they, uh, again, don't realize it until it's all gone, that they are the custodians of art and culture. They have to keep those stories going. I decided after the civil war ended in Sri Lanka, I was in Budapest. It's very funny, isn't it? Because my uncle, at the age of 10, my uncle used to forces to, you know, it's our idea of the Sunday roast. Uh, you come, you know, the whole family gathers in Kuala Lumpur uh, every Sunday to eat cool. Cool is K-O-L, is a uh, very specific Sri Lankan Jaffna dish because up there in the north of Sri Lanka, Jaffna, it's surrounded by sea, uh, but also it is very arid land, it's not very fertile, so it's uh, when the monsoon season starts and the harvest is finished, all they have is the seafood around them and these palmera palm trees. And the root of the palmera palm uh, is dried during the hot season and made into a flower uh, called udil, which then thickens the stew, the fish stew, and it becomes cool. That's like a superfood that kept people going for generations. So that's our peasant food. And Malaysians, you know, uh, who my grandparents came at the turn of the, so 1896, I think was the first indication of our family coming to Malaya at that time. And uh, 
from, you know, they'd kept that tradition going. And my uncle, who had then been to Hungary, he was a, quite high up in telecoms, and he had gone on this world trip, and he had been to Hungary, and he was trying to tell us, look, I know you want to go to a and but this is cool, our, our food, it's like Hungarian goulash, right? And this is at the age of 10. Spool, many years later, 2009, I am in a hotel watching CNN, and it was the last days of the Civil War, when if you watch the killing fields of Sri Lanka, you know what I mean. The, the uh, Sri Lankan army at the, at the Tamil Tigers had got all these civilians to one area. And the army was saying that the, the Tamil Tigers are using civilians as human shields, but there were hospitals, and the GPS system had uh, indicated where the hospitals are. And often they have Red Cross, Red Cross people go there, but the Sri Lankan army bombed the hospitals. And, and therefore, it's a war crime. This is the, there is no evidence for that, and that's what happened. And we were watching it unravel on CNN in Budapest. I go downstairs, and we are going to a fish restaurant, and they have Hungarian goulash. And of course, right there, then, my memory goes back to the age of 10, and I'm thinking, there's no accidents in life. You're a writer. You know what this means. This means that the palmyra palm trees that created the thickening agent that's going to form cool that is now being cooked in Sydney by the Tamil diaspora in Toronto, in Malaysia. That's not going to be anymore. That recipe will be lost. With my head, this is, I mean, it's not true. I mean, it didn't pan out, but the trees are still there. But at that time when I saw that video, that CNN uh, video of, of, of the land completely raised to the ground, by bombing, I thought this is it. This is the end of my my tribe. And uh, you know, the start of the civil war in '83 was was after the bombing of the Jaffna Library. Jaffna Library had 97,000 unique works of Dravidian Tamil literature. And when that was bombed, that was when it became an armed struggle, because in a way, cultural genocide is one way of getting rid of. Uh, a race, a, 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 you know, a culture, especially a proud culture that is very uh, now, you know, dispersed. So um, I started to think about the kind of work I was doing. I, had, I was all prepared to do a, a British Asian show, a South Asian show. I can't even remember what it was, but I had to tell the Arts Council, I can't can't do it. Can you just let me give me a year because we're going to start to apply for this national portfolio organization. I need to be looking at my, you know, the, my Tamil uh, pedigree, my Tamil, you know, background. What what is what does it mean? Because for the first time in my life, I thought, okay, I belong somewhere. Actually, it's gone, and through that sense of loss, one finds the need to actually start to think, to, uh, to, to, to put back the jigsaw puzzle. And so I said, you know, I, I can't continue doing just fit, trying to fit in, trying to, you know, even though I didn't feel I was always fitting in, but I was, the attempt was always there, and I was thinking that actually what I'm really about is to really examine what it is that makes human beings leave their homeland, whether it's big epic journeys or whether it's even moving from Wales to Manchester. What does that mean? We are only different in, de in degree. What does it mean when you, when you say, you know, a lot of black people, I was in uh, America, ironically, just before the, the, the Exeter conference, I was doing curry tales in, uh, in New Jersey, and I remember that Obama, uh, he was, he was, this is uh, 2008, so he was, just won the democratic uh, mandate for his, the presidential elections, 
And the theatre I was doing my show at is Crossroads Theatre. It's a it's a African American theatre company that every black from Denzel in Washington to to uh, Ozzy Davis to Ruby D, the all the, the great black actors had been to this theatre. It's thirty years old, and and it's it's an amazing theatre. And I was doing the show there, and all of them said, finally we can put our suitcases down. And I knew exactly what they meant. I knew exactly what they meant. It's that sense of feeling I'm safe because I think that you know that is that is so true and I think that I still don't feel that. I still feel you know that the ground is going to shift every time okay now it's an economic downturn and who is already feeling that in Europe you can already feel the sense that you know these people are looking at immigrants and, and the idea of what an immigrant is, you know, the idea of seeking refuge, the idea of asylum, was such a noble idea, especially where I live in Manchester, it was always that noble tradition of sanctuary, of giving sanctuary to whoever was, was in trouble, has now become a threat, a, a, a dangerous thing, a horrid um, uh, issue to be taken up by right-wing politicians. And I, uh, so, I, yeah, I am redirecting my, my work towards looking at something specific to me, but hopefully writing it in a way that expands the discussion and makes it into that whole idea of, of these global journeys, whether it's small or, or epic. You spoke a little bit, you mentioned the term just briefly, uh, in the little thing you said about British South Asian uh, work that your that the Oz Council were trying to possibly mould you into that mould. Um, what does that term mean to you, British South Asian? I don't think they were trying to mould you, and I don't think they they themselves. Whenever we ask, or we, I think they kind of it's a useful label for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. It's useful for them. It's not useful for us who have to negotiate what that means because I think it is the word Asian. Uh, only makes sense because um, of the uh, very painful partition that happened in, in the subcontinent that makes uh, that word convenient. Uh, I think it was you know something that was absolutely just a convenient term to be used so that you don't say Pakistani or, or Indian because one doesn't know. Uh, uh, for me, Asia is a different. I'm Southeast Asian, and then I know East Asia and South Asia, but I, I, I think British Asian has become a group of people to me. A group of people starting with, you know, the, the, the first generation of artists who are involved in theatre, like Jinjin Burma, who have a very distinct place, and, and, and you know, we, we, we all stand on their shoulders, but at the same time, the but is a, it's not a big but, it's just a small but, but it is from a particular experience. And for me, it is probably very specific. Um, uh, uh, many of the artists, I know Tamasha, Kali, uh, Tara, come from a, a notion of the subcontinent, but through Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's very specific, almost a hybrid is a very, I don't mean it in a negative way, it's a kind of a, a, an amalgam of, of many experiences that I think even they have not been allowed to explore enough. Because, you know, to, to use Swahili, they are, as much as they use Punjabi or Bengali to use, I don't think even Bengali is a, a part of it, in fact, it's become incredibly Punjabi-led. And I've said this many times, and it sounds like a like a, another ugly truth to be explored. But then everybody kind of, oh yeah, yeah, because they were the first, so you know, it just seems like that. But actually, um, I'll, t I'll give you an example. Um, and I know this is going to be public, but you know, I, I, I did say at the time. But I was invited um, to be part of the workshop team for the RSC production of Much Ado About Nothing. And I know the director, who I respect greatly, Iqbal Khan, and Iqbal was very, very, very interested in exploring the idea, which I thought was incredibly interesting, of 
representing the entire subcontinent within that play, that, that, that there will be the idea of the South Indian maybe represented there, that there would be Bengali, uh, someone from maybe Calcutta or Orissa, and you know, that, that there would be just that, you know, and so, which is what Delhi is like, you know, Delhi is a, 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 a meeting point for all of these, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, because, um, you know, you're dealing with the subcontinent, I think, you know, and all those many languages. So we arrive at day one of the rehearsal, and there is a dialect coach there, and she's very specifically thinking about Punjabi and the Punjabi accent and the Punjabi sensibility. And that was kind of either consciously or unconsciously decided, but it was decided. And I had, because I think in the way I do, I think, you know, I had to take away my. I, I tried very hard to just be an actress, a jobbing actress, and just try and enter into the experience like you would, you know, like any actor would, you know, which is that's the director's vision and you just, you know, do it, you just go and do it. But I was increasingly feeling that this was this was a done deal almost and, and I think increasingly I've been feeling that in the whole idea of what is British Asian because uh, I know that I can go and enjoy something that seems to hit on some aspect of Bollywood or some aspect of Indian life. But it's the same as, as, as if I were going to watch something that had a Russian influence or a French influence, if you see what I mean. It doesn't go deep enough for me to be really feeling that it's unimmersed in it. Mm. And whether we do that consciously or not, I don't know. Whether we you know, I'll give you an example. One of my shows, Dancing with the Walls, explored the idea of how Bharatanatyam was brought into public, into the public domain. Um, you know, this thousands of years old tradition was then eroded, became very, very, um, well, almost extinct by the uh, late 18th century, uh, 19th century, by Victorian morality in India and by the Brahmins. India high caste, who thought that giving girls to, or, or, or you know, giving girls to their, giving their daughters to the temple to be temple dancers, married to God, was something exploitative and should be banned. But what happened was that these girls, these women, who had met a long tradition of being very, very revered, and you know, they were very much like uh, the most educated women. They, they were, you know, they used poetry, their work, and they were artists, and then to then just stop that, that tradition just went. And Rukmini Devi Arundel was, was in, 19, in the 1920s, this high caste Brahmin woman married to George Arundel, who was a theosophist, who went out to India with Annie Dasant. And he was a noble, heroic man who fought for the rights of Indians to vote and the rights of Indian women to vote. He was uh, married to Rukmini Devi and, and they were going on a on a journey to Australia, and who was on board but Anna Pavlova and Rukmini Devi and George Morandil had seen her do the swan in, I think, Delhi, and had gone to say how much they admire and admired her work and all that. And Rukmini here, dressed in a summary and all that, was saying to her, can I study ballet? Because I, I just, you know, adore it. And we have photographs of Rukmini in a tutu in 1926. Uh, and could be taught by Cleo Nodi, who is one of the principal dancers in Anna Pavlova's company. And after a while, Anna Pavlova wrote her a letter and said, what's going on? Why are you, as an Indian woman, especially as a philosopher, why are you, you know, learning ballet when you should be looking at your own dance? And so that's what started her on her journey. But it was George Arundel, really, who was the, was the hero of the piece. And I wrote that. And, um, I remember one of the first questions in the post-play discussion was, was it your intention, Rani, to present Indian women as, as negative characters and as the white man in, during British Raj, India, to be the hero of your piece? I thought the question really extraordinary, and I know exactly where that came from. But the idea that I was then bucking the trend and presenting, these are historic figures, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, not a work of fiction. Some of it was my fiction, and I took liberties with, but the actual 
story of these, these, these two people was the truth. And the idea that you know I was presenting a heroic white man in that period was uncomfortable for a lot of people. But the actresses who were in the play, so this is I'm giving you an example of how um, actually I think we should start training actors into looking at and cult other cultures and, and, and really imbibing that. If I was doing a Chekhov play and had to wear a corset, I would be wearing it from day one of rehearsal because you sit differently. And if I was wearing a sari, I mean the, 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 the actresses took it for granted that they would be able to do it and, and walk gracefully in a sari. No, they were clumping around and doing the, the 21st century thing of clumping in a sari. And mm -hmm. these, the sari mattered in 1926 India, the way you wore sari mattered. The blouse had already been introduced before that. It was, people, women were, were, were without the cholis, you know. And you see photographs of these women in leg of mutton sleeves because it was a very Victorian imposition of that. So to actually, you know, so it, it's, it's that whole idea that we all are making huge assumptions about what it means to be Asian without really looking at the specifics of it. So, so either we, we touch upon it in a very superficial way, or if we really want to go in depth, we need to be really conscious of the specifics because art is not the details. What time is it? It's 6.20. Shall we wind up? <laughs>